Shad Adversity. Greetings, I'm Shad, and this video is kind of the next in an unnamed and unannounced series where I go into detail about specific things related to swords. So, I have a video where I talk about how deadly were swords in real life, uh, another one where I've talked about why you would actually want to fold steel if you're making a sword, and the advantages and disadvantages that comes from folded steel and swords. And in this video, I'm going to be speaking specifically about the final stage in sword construction. Quenching, but also tempering. And we're going to explain what specifically is happening to the sword blade and why it's so crucially important. So if you don't know, the, the quench of a sword is after you've uh, you know gotten the, this material and you've beaten it into the shape and you have the shape you want, there is a very crucial stage in which it is doused. It's heated up and doused in either water or oil. Why do they do that? Why don't they just let it cool down naturally? What is this quenching doing and why is it so important? Fundamentally, it is because the sword is not a pure element, okay? It's not just pure iron. There are other trace elements in it and the most important being carbon, okay? Uh, to get steel, you need a certain percentage of carbon in the iron. Quenching becomes massively crucial when you have this carbon component because dependent on the heat in the, in the material will depend on how that carbon will be distributed uh, within the actual atomic structure of the iron. And sorry, that's not the structure of the iron atom itself, it's uh, how the iron atoms are connected with other iron atoms, specifically. You see, when iron is hot, and the terminology here is when the iron reach the austenite phase, okay? So austenite is the name for iron that is at a a specific temperature in which it has lost magnetic interaction. The iron atoms have actually switched in this phase to being body centered or like face cubic. There's two phases. There's face cubic centered and body centered cubic. I'm really messing that up. But basically there's more room in between the iron atoms when it's this hot, which means the carbon atoms can all fit around evenly wherever they want. When iron is cool, those atoms are much closer together and they don't like having carbon in between. And so if they have the opportunity, they'll try and squeeze out the carbon in between these iron atoms. But that's interesting because the carbon can't leap out of the material. So what happens is uh, the larger majority of iron atoms force most of the carbon into these really dense pockets in the iron and it creates two parts within the iron. Iron that basically doesn't have any carbon in called ferrite and then portions like veins within the, the material now that has a very high amount of carbon that's been forced in and those, those lines are called cementite. Now add ferrite and cementite together you have have a type of crystalline structure in the steel which is called perlite. Now these cementite lines can only form if there is enough carbon in the iron to begin with. And their density in terms of the amount of iron to carbon that's in these cementite veins is actually quite high. And that is because the rest of the iron didn't want the carbon there and it forced it out. That is what will happen to the carbon if it cools down slowly. It gives the iron enough time to push out the carbon where it wants to go. Now, if you can control the rate in which this iron cools down, you can actually manipulate what is happening here in regards to the iron and the carbon. And this is very important because depending on how the carbon ends up being distributed within the material will change the properties of this steel dramatically. And this is phenomenal. Think about this. It's like how many other materials can be affected to such a varying level uh, in this way. It's amazing. The other thing is when iron cools, it forms structures in its, when it's heated up in its austenite phase, okay, there's not many structures within it or it gives the opportunity for the structures to become uniform and very even across the board. When it cools down, it'll form these structures. And when and if you're beating it while it is cool, you can mess up those structures considerably. And some say uh, forged steel creates advantages over steel that hasn't been forged, like if you get a sword blade that's basically being milled and cut out of a rod of steel. And I say it's because you're able to work hard in the edges. Now work hardening can be useful in regards to swords, uh, but that's only if you're working it cold, okay? And this is how bronze swords were hardened to pretty impressive levels. But as soon as you heat it up after work hardening it, 
it loosens the insides, all right? It basically gives the opportunity for the stresses to be released and moved around and become uniform. And so if you're any work hardening that you're doing beating, as soon as you heat it up, okay, you're losing whatever benefits, but also detriments you might have put into the steel because uh, work hardening things can make it more brittle. It can create micro fractures even. But as soon as you heat it up again, you, ha you give those micro fractures an opportunity to weld together once more. So a very important stage before you even reach the quenching stage, as it, with swords especially, is the stage that is called normalizing. So once they beat the shape into this steel, that you, they know they've been messing up the insides, the, these crystal structures and everything because of all the punishment you've been putting into the steel. So they go through a phase of heating it up to austenite level and then letting it cool down naturally and then heating up and letting it cool down. And each time you're bringing this material, the steel, into its austenite phase, you're giving it an opportunity to reset and even out any of the str uh, you know, uneven stresses there. To the point where it's being completely normalized. It's all even across the board in regards to uh, any areas that might be more compressed or stressful, very important. And then you have almost like a blank slate but in the right shape. So now you have the opportunity to manipulate the hardness of the steel, but also its ductility, okay? How flexible it can be. And this is where we get to the crucial quench. And remember, the very reason why this is even possible, why it's having such an effect, is because there's carbon in the material and the iron doesn't want the carbon in it, okay? It's trying to push the carbon out, which forces it into more condensed pockets of cementite. If the carbon wasn't in the steel, quenching would have no effect. You, like uh, quenching pure iron, even though you probably can't get pure iron, like pure elemental iron, quenching would have no effect on it. It's because there's carbon in it and the heat affects the distribution of the carbon. It's all about that. Now what's interesting, perlite, which is the type of steel in which you just let it cool down normally, is considered a hard steel, but not nearly as hard as it could be if it gets quenched. And so perlite in this range is a softer version, even though it's a lot harder than just pure iron. In terms of the hardness of steels, it's one of the softer versions because there is a different type of, you know, crystal structure that you can achieve within this steel if it gets quenched. And it's this amazing thing, okay, if you heat up iron in which it forms into austenite, those cementite kind of veins that are in the iron will get broken down and the carbon will then be distributed evenly throughout. If it's like, because this is the thing, it's not like the carbon can move from this area on the material and all the way there. It doesn't move around like that. Uh, you only get pure, proper, you know, carbon distribution uh, through two ways, okay? You've either fully liquefied the iron uh, in the smelting process or you folded it and evened it out that way. Now we're looking at the very micro, okay? Uh, this type of distribution, the type of crystalline structures that will form within the steel. And when heated up to where austenite is formed in the steel, uh, the carbon is, is not forced into, you know, these veins, pocket lines or anything like that. It's just all around there. And then, if you were to cool it down rapidly, you can actually give those iron atoms not enough time to force it out into these more condensed pockets. And you can trap the carbon into a more even distribution within these atomic structures. And a different, amazing crystalline structure is formed within the steel called martensite. Now martensite is simply that. It has a more even distribution of carbon and you have these really like it's almost a lattice of disconnecting you know crystal structures and stuff like that all around which creates a very high level of hardness uh, in the material. Martensite is basically the hardest steel structure that you can get but there's a lot of stress in it all right and so if you like get full-blown martensite all the way uh, you can get it so hard that it becomes even brittle and it can chip, crack, and snap uh, quite easily. But still, this is very, very useful. Like, this is extremely hard stuff, and so this is what many tool steels are actually made out of. And so, you know those drill heads that can just drill right through, you know, softer types of steels? Uh, chisels, files, that can file off other steels as well? Martensite.
Now, of course, this can be very, very useful to swords because you want swords to have a very hard edge, but you don't want them to be too brittle. And so there's a couple of different ways to tackle this uh, brittleness kind of thing. And interestingly, uh, it was done differently in other parts of the world. So in Japan, they wanted as hard an edge as you can can. They, they want martensite. They want high carbon martensite on the edge, but they don't want it snapping in two. So the way they fix that is by making the blade quite much thicker than what you would consider and not having it hardened all the way through. Uh, it has a much softer core and back. In fact, they put clay on it so that the blade cools down at different rates. The edge cools down faster than the back, which then creates a, a type where you get martensite on the edge, but the softer hard type of steel, perlite on the back, and then it has a core of almost just iron that is not carburized. Now, having the soft back does not make the sword shock absorbent, all right? That, that, that's bull. If you hit the sword on something in which it will cause the edge to chip, having a soft back will not prevent that chip, all right? And so the thing where people say, because the katana has a soft back, it makes it shock absorbent or is it chipping is bull crap. It's wrong, all right? What that will create, it, it will prevent the sword from snapping in two. That's the difference. So if the katana, the sword, is hit on something that is really hard, like, I don't know, a piece of rock or a bit of hard steel or anything like that, in which it will cause a micro fracture or a chip or a dint on the blade, it will simply prevent that crack from traveling all the way through and the blade snapping in two. It won't create a fatal weak point and it'll still, and so even like little small chips, all right, can potentially create a fatal weakness in the blade that will lead to a full snap but if it has a soft back, it'll stop. And so you can actually get away with using a katana that has a couple of chips on the blade if it's made in a traditional way and you'll get a functional sword for much longer. There's another really, really intriguing and in my opinion, better way to handle uh, this hardness, almost this fragility that exists because of how hard the steel has become when you quench it. And it is the tempering phase. Now, people who are unfamiliar with these terms, uh, I know before I did the research, I basically thought quenching and tempering was the same thing. No, they're two different and specific stages. And so the quenching has created this really hard steel. Tempering is a process where you, once it's cooled down, so you, you, you quench it in either water or oil, it's cold, it's cold now, you just leave it, that's it, and you let it rest. And then after that, you can reheat it to a very small level, like nowhere near. You do not want to form, uh, you know, form austenite and ruin the quench that you just did, because there is a risk of uh, like cracks forming if you cool it too fast. The blade is going through a lot of stress in this process. All these iron atoms are like, what's going on? Like, have a look at this quench of a katana, right? Look at how it's bending. It first bends forward because the edge is cooling quicker because of the clay on it. And then it bends all the way back to give the katana its iconic curve if it didn't have a curve put in through the forging process because the back cools quicker, but the back is also thicker, which creates more kind of torque. It pulls that, you know, uh, sword in that direction, creating the curve. So yes, a lot of stress can cause cracks and you don't want to ruin it if you've done it successfully. So you're not going to reheat this up to form austenite. You're only going to heat it up a little bit and you heat it up to where it glows blue. What this does, it releases stress in between these dislocations, okay? Creating a much greater level of kind of ductility and flex in between the crystal structure that's being formed within it. And this is how you create a spring. You lose a tiny level of hardness, and I have to emphasize the edges is still really hard, okay? A sword that is made out of martensite that has been tempered correctly has a hardness way higher than if it was, you know, you just had a different type of hard steel, say like perlite. And then you have the added advantage of this flexibility, which is amazing. Having true flexibility in a sword enables it to absorb such, you know, forces and withstand a massive amount of abuse, like a level of abuse that many other types of swords that aren't built in this way can't handle, which will cause bending and snapping. Now, were swords always made in this way? No, uh, in fact, they were made in different times uh, throughout the past. More rare if you go all the way back, but we do know that there is steel of a quality level in which it was possible to make spring steel out of, so proper martensite swords, which requires a monoblade with no differential hardening, where it's been the same uniform hardness across the board. 
Because if you were to make a blade that had a differential hardness, that means part of it is has the spring quality, but part of it doesn't, which means it's not going to spring. It would snap in part portions or bend in portions, spring in the other, and it just doesn't work. It needs a uniform mono grade. But the qualities of steel that were made in India, the Middle East, and even early parts in the medieval period, it wasn't nearly as common in Europe, but it certainly was possible because there was the quality of steel available in which you could quench and temper it to the level to make a really good spring. But of course, when you get to the latter end of the medieval period, absolutely, spring steel was around. And so at the moment, the pinnacle kind of sword quality is a sword that has rigidity because of its structure. Okay, if you look at the cross-sectional geometry, how rigid does the actual geometry create it? It's also, you know, strong in terms of the material sense, but also has flexibility to absorb shock and the punishment that can be put onto sword blades. And if you were to compare a spring steel sword that's made out of good quality steel, even if it was made traditionally forged, hammer and everything like that, if you were to compare a spring steel sword with the traditional made katana, the spring steel sword is actually far superior. Now, will it hold its head edge longer? Generally, a katana's edge is harder still. That does not mean it can become sharper, all right? You can get a soft steel and sharpen it easily as much as what katanas and even razor blades can get. It just means it won't hold that edge for nearly as long, all right? Hardness does not determine how sharp a sword can get, but it does determine how long it will hold its edge. Now, this doesn't really affect how the swords perform right after they've been sharpened to the highest level that they can be. And so any, you know, soldier swordsman worth his weight is going to keep his sword in proper maintenance and sharpen it up to the level he wants because depending on its use will actually affect how sharp you want the blade. You do not always want it incredible crazy sharp and there's actually a, there's even a difference between sharp enough to shave and even sharper still. There are levels of sharpness which just boggle the mind. But if you were to compare these swords against one another, you know, properly made and everything like that, the advantage always falls with the spring steel sword because it can withstand more abuse. And this is why a large portion of the non-traditional yet high quality katana reproductions are actually made out of mono spring steel. And they do this because they actually produce a sword that is of functional higher quality than a traditional made katana. And I'm purely talking about its functional use as a sword, how long it'll hold its edge and how much abuse it can withstand, not in terms of its artistic quality. In fact, traditional made katanas will be pro prone to bending and keeping a bend, but a spring steel sword will bend and flex back, okay? It's pretty, you know, evident and easy to understand why spring steel holds the edge in this regard. And traditionally made katanas were not made out of spring steel because they've been differentially hardened in a different kind of mindset or approach to handle the potential brittleness that such a hard type of steel can create. But do you see how insanely important the quenching process is in regards to making a sword? You can actually ruin a sword completely if you incorrectly quench it, and even if it's been made out of perfect steel and has been made to the most masterful level, if the quenching is done poorly, you can ruin the sword and it can be and you can have a sword that actually is made out of less perfect steel and if it's been quenched and tempered correctly it'll perform way better than the sword that's pure steel but not quenched correctly. That's how crucial it is. And that is exactly what is happening, okay, in regards to the iron and the carbon and the martensite, the perlite and the cementite and all that, the, the fun stuff. And there you go. I hope that you might have learned something. But if not, I hope you've enjoyed and I do hope to see you again. Until that time, 